I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the MVP Show. My intention is that you listen to the stories of these MVP guests and are inspired to become an MVP and bring value to the world through your skills. If you have not checked it out already, I do a YouTube series called How to Become an MVP. The link is in the show notes. With that, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from Rotterdam, South Holland in the Netherlands. He's a Power Platform Consultant at Power Bauer. He was first awarded as MVP in 2022. The great thing is he started as a citizen developer and he's grown in his career now to become a full Power Platform Solution Architect. Uh, and he's a freelance consultant. Is, have I got that right? He's still a freelance consultant? Yes, that's totally correct. I just started actually this year in January, so just super fresh wow fantastic as always links to it the, and uh, links will be in the show notes to his bio social media etc if you want to follow what he's up to welcome to the show miguel thanks thanks for having me good to have you on the show it must be nighttime there for you is that right it's actually 902 so uh we just had election day so uh voting is over so uh it's just regional elections so uh but yeah it's nighttime it's dark wow Winter's almost over. We're on the north, uh, north hemisphere. I'm going into autumn here in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, so yeah exactly. The, yeah. the whole switch round. Tell me what you do when you're not working. What do you do for fun? What's the best things to eat in uh, Rotterdam? Uh, like, is it the same as the best things to eat in um, Anst- uh, Amsterdam, which I have spent, you know, with the, the croquettes, of course, uh, a, a lot. Um, and then, yeah, tell us a bit about your family. Yeah, well, uh, family is about to change. Um, my wife is uh, is pregnant at the moment, so a lot of change going on. So actually today uh, I just installed a, a small bed where my son will be sleeping. So that's nice. Um, yeah, and the food, actually, there is a, a, a typical Rotterdam dish. Well, you cannot really call it a dish, but it's like a nighttime snack. And it's like kebab with fries and salad and then uh, garlic sauce. I'm not sure if that's the name, but it's like a jam-packed, uh, many carbs, <laughs> perfect for the night. Perfect for drinking beer by the sounds. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, and what do you do for fun? Um, for fun, um, my wife always calls me uh, an old guy. Um, when I have spare time, I just actually like to read The Economist. Uh, and that's basically it. Just uh, boring stuff. That's that's me. Yeah. Well, well that, that's a very, I find at the moment, a very interesting topic, the economy. Um, what are your thoughts yeah. on what's going on uh, in the globe? You know, there's a lot of predictions we're heading into a recession. Um, there's a lot of signs with interest rates, of course, going through the roof. What are your yeah, thoughts exactly. on all your Especially research? Especially now with the, the what is it, the, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and uh, I actually just read that the, even the the Swiss, the Credit Suisse is uh, is sort of uh, in uh, what is it? They're they're balancing at the moment. So yeah, it's uh, interesting times. Interest rates are rising, so uh, everything is uh, basically the, the 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 era of free money is over. So that's what I actually like to to read about, and what it's especially also with the Ukraine. It, it's all connected, it's all about the money, right? So that's yeah, that's what I'm interested in. Tell me, if you had a crystal ball and looked at the next five years, what are we in for? <laughs> It's only your predictions, right? You can only, well, it, we're only recording it and placing it on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, this is not no financial advice. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Just uh, enjoy life. Spend it <laughs> now you can. 
And uh, I think that's the best advice to give. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Just enjoy life. Tell me about your story. I was, I was interested to read that, you know, you started as a citizen developer and you are now a solution architect. And why I think this is going to be an interesting story to unpack is there's going to be a lot of people out there that are not even in the power platform space yet. Or they might have, you know, in their companies had a few apps and they're like, you know, wow, I, I love this. You know, I wonder if I could, I could make something of this and, you know, and pivot my career. Tell us about that journey for you. What was the first time, you know, you got exposed to the Power Platform right through to ultimately what you're doing today as a solution architect? Take as long as you want. Yeah, all right. So, um, well, I was just reading about you and you started in 2003 and you you just entered the, 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 the ball game from the dynamic side. And I see it like a spectrum. You're, you're either on the, the sort of the citizen development, the low code, the, the real low code, like it's the, the, the stupid low code and the smart low code. That's, <laughs> maybe you can see it like that. And you came in from the dynamic side, but I, I just came in from the total opposite, basically. So uh, I started architectural engineering. So I'm an architectural engineer. Um, that's what I studied. And then um, I just... Uh, like during the the thesis, I already entered the IT world. I already liked it when I was a young kid, but I just studied architectural engineering. And then um, on my first job, that there, there was sort of IT mixed with um, uh, architectural engineering. So basically, they design um, in in architectural engineering nowadays. It's all three D engineered, right? So everything is sort of um, they they create a virtual building basically so they can check on okay what is the MEP uh, will they hit structural elements all those sort of because there is no prototyping right it's just everything is a one one time it's not like you got a car that you got a million of the the same types it's just one building I, I tell you so why why this is done. it means so much to me right now is that I'm just having my house built so the architects doing their piece. And then the architect yeah. was like, oh, we've got to involve an engineer. And there's like another $25,000 bill for the engineer to do all exactly. the calculations, the loads, exactly. the, yeah. Exactly. And they like in, in the, the super giant buildings, like the corporate buildings, they all have their own model, basically. So the, the MEP guys, they they basically design the, the electrical outlets and all the piping and the same for, for plumbing, all those sort of stuff. But then the, arc, the the structural guy comes in and then he wants a giant beam because, yeah, those guys, they just like giant beams. and But they, it, it all has to fit together, right? So um, what we did at, at that moment is like uh, the, the, the client also got their requirements. So we tried to make a, a um, basically a database, which was already low code, a different platform, but it was sort of low code relational database. And then we hooked it onto the 3D model to do some automated tests if, it's, if it meets the requirements, basically. So that's what I did then. And then I already sort of there, there is where my database knowledge sort of, um, yeah, gained a bit of experience. And then I joined Arcadis, which is a global engineering firm. And then there I joined a small digital team. So basically we looked in all types of digitalization and how it can improve the, the, the engineering world. So we looked into virtual reality. So you could do safety walks upfront for uh, manufacturers. Uh, but then also I ran into the, the, the Power Platform first by Power BI. So um, we actually moved the, the Rotterdam office, it moved. And then we, uh, or at least they installed all sort of smart, uh, smart building um, telemetry to collect uh, telemetry. And they hooked it onto Azure, and then I read it into a Power BI report, and I used some some visualizations to just get some real time monitoring to see wh- which uh, basically which desks are available, what's the humidity, all that sort of stuff, what's the the loudness. Like if you got a if if you want to focus, then you want obviously a more quiet place. But if you're in a call, then you might just not be that. Yeah, you don't might care that much about it. So that's what I then created. And so the first journey was Power BI, basically. But then I looked uh, around because you go to office.com and they see all the apps there, right? And then I saw Power BI and then I said, hey, there's also Power Automate. There's also Power Apps. 
And then I just, I just tried it and then I felt, okay, this is cool. And then I gained some more experience and then I started building solutions. I wasn't even aware of what solutions were. It was just all in the, in the default environment. And I, <laughs> I was just hacking my way into it basically. And uh, that worked actually pretty good. Um, and then uh, I, I just, I really liked it. So I learned more about it. I read into it. And then eventually when I was talking to the IT department and sort of suggesting what sort of uh, environment strategy they should use, then I thought maybe it's time to to move. So then I uh, basically switched career officially. So then I joined an IT company. And there I basically did the same thing, but then officially and then full time. So, um, and also with, with more like-minded people. So that was also really nice that I can learn from. Um, there is where I met Daniel Luskovich. He's also known in the community. Um, so he was sort of my mentor at that moment. And I, I know you like mentoring too. So he was mine basically. And that, that, that's what I did for like a year and a half. And then I thought, uh, yeah, okay, why not? I, I like what I'm doing and um, yeah, I can do it. And then I took the leap and uh, for now it's working fine. So that's basically how it went. And then in that middle part where I was just, um, that's maybe also nice to mention that like also the time that I switched to Sojiti, um that's also the moment where I thought, okay, now it might be interesting to, to sort of, I really um, gained a lot of experience by all the community blogs, all the videos, everything what was out there. So I thought I wanted to do something back basically. And then at that time it was December. That's when I was thinking I was doing some sort of a, a, a code challenge, like uh, in December, right? They got all those sort of challenges that every day something new is coming on. And then you can just, uh, yeah, it's like small puzzles. And then it, uh, yeah, then it sort of struck my mind to do something similar. I'm not sure if it's real, really similar at the moment what I'm doing right now, but then at least that was the trigger for me. Okay, maybe I should do something with it because I, I really liked uh, the, all the, the, the smaller pieces, but I just wanted to have some sort of a, just one topic that I could focus on and then just, yeah, dive into that. And that's what I did from then. And um, that was actually pretty nice because it's it's nice to share something, but it's also, I also used it to just focus on topics that I wasn't really knowledgeable about yet. So I had to dig into it and then, yeah, that's also beneficial for me, right? Um, and that's what I did. And after one year, I, I got, uh, actually within the year, I got nominated and I got the award. So that's pretty cool. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. Tell me now about what's your, you know, we've got about five different uh, tools um, as in the premium tools. So I'm talking about Power Apps, Automate, mm -hmm. BI, Virtual Agents, Power Pages. Of those, what's your kind of go-to? What do you love the most out of them? Or is it a combination that you, you're often working with? What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is a hard one for me. But I, I think I have to say Power Automate. Okay. Are you, are you using Power Automate desktop as well? No. No? <laughs> no? I'm not the biggest fan, actually. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, but yeah, I just like the, the, the whole cloud. Like what I really like, where, what I think is the power of the Power Platform is the whole democratization of, the, of technology, basically. And I think desktop flows could be a bit that that's more it, it it needs more or it requires more skill to make it and that's the same thing with model driven apps which i'm i'm actually really enjoying now because now i'm building solutions and i'm using alm and then i think okay if i'm in a, in a solution then it makes more sense to pack it up into one solution so then you're into the data first world but then if you're in data first then a model driven app becomes more makes more sense basically so what i just mentioned you started from the dynamic side right and uh, me more on the uh, what yeah maybe just the, the power automate side the, it, it's it's like a spectrum also what microsoft is uh, propagating basically like it, it's like a whole spectrum right so from real citizen development to pro code and i think that the 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 yeah, basically desktop flows and model driven apps and Dataverse is more on the on the, the pro code side. And I think Power Automate like Cloud Flows and Canvas apps is more on the on the citizen development side. 
And I think I think that that's the real entry point. So so Power Automate, Canvas apps, that's where people get in, and then like the people who are knowledge or take time to get more involved, they can just proceed onto the next sort of uh, yeah platform uh, services. Let's unpack RPA and uh, <laughs> and Power Automate Desktop. Why, why do you why do you think it's uh, what are your thoughts? Because you obviously you've got some opinions there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's not like like I'm real. Uh, I have a real passionate uh, opinion about it, but um, in my opinion, like everything is cloud flows nowadays. So just use APIs, and like that makes the most sense to me. So RPA is, is more like a, a last resort, in my opinion. And I probably get <laughs> people will start haunting me now, but uh, that, that's my uh, my honest opinion about it. Yeah. I'm a Dutch guy, right? We are just blunt. <laughs> so here's the thing. You're, you're right. It's harder to use. I've been trying to use it for the last couple yeah. of days and nothing just works how I would expect it to, to work, you know? Yeah, and I, so I have to do heaps of research like and stuff like that. The one desktop takes it different than the other, right? So that's you have to take into account. So it's, it's a bit harder to get up and running. You've seen Microsoft's investment in OpenAI, right? And that they're playing big in that space. I think yeah. Microsoft's potential biggest AI Trojan horse is Power Automate Desktop? Yeah, do you? Yeah, actually, today there was the there was a post that it's in. They evolve it if they evolve it to what it could be. So, so this is what I see. Let's say if we looked in five years' time, what um, Power Automate Desktop could be. If it was set up to monitor just everything that I was doing every day on my computer, all the interactions, and then it was given the command, "Look at how you could." automate various tasks. And I'll give you a very simple one that I'm doing at the moment. I work for a company that requires through their single sign-on at least three clicks every day when I log into the machine. Those three clicks grind me because they're just wasted freaking time, right? And you're waiting for the next screen, blah, blah, blah. And that's what I'm, you know, at at the moment. Um, And the the thing that's got me hooked up is browser profiles uh, RPA doesn't like to deal or uh, robot uh, as in uh, powered by desktop struggles with that because it in the pop-up window when you, it says select a browser it says the uh power automate's not installed in that window yet it is installed yeah, but it's not in that pop-up window which is then throwing an error and that's why I has to, I have to look at it from a programmatic point of view how to command line that piece out and that's where i'm just just working through at the moment but this is why i think it's going to be the biggest deal ever that's going to change the world even um for everybody using windows and that is because i don't know if they've got it on mac or anything else at the moment but that tool if it was monitoring everything i did and then all of a sudden i'm getting 10 percent, 20 percent productivity improvements a day because it's looking at everything it's looking at my emails you know, naturally, I'll just switch it off when I'm looking at porn. Um, but you know, I'd have to be careful that it was so. It, it was. It could be monitoring everything, right? And then all, yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden, in a year and a half's time, twenty five percent of my day, as that continues to improve, as it continues to learn, it learns me, it learns me. That's all of a sudden, twenty five percent of my job's automated. Then, in another two years' time, fifty percent of my job's automated. Like it it pre knows everything because it knows how it works. It knows what my work patterns would be, Um, and that and that's why I think RPA because they installed it in Windows 11 by default, right? It's part of the operating system install. I think could be the most powerful tool Microsoft has going forward in the AI realm because I tell you what, interesting take on it. I bet you it'll get to a hundred percent. Well, by that time, then probably Europe is really uh, done because we have uh, strict privacy stuff. So that part probably won't come in in Europe and then our productivity is gone. So, <laughs> But the thing is, as long as it contained it, right? Because what I'm seeing now, yeah. already people are creating AIs that if you've got a juicy enough um, GPU card that you can run these AIs, large ones, standalone. So there's no data handoff, right? Everything of that could be contained on my PC, Not no privacy breaching or anything, you know, in what it's doing. So I, I think that if it's a, like a localized version, yes, there's the, we need the, the you know, the super, the, the quantum computing ultimately is going to affect AI and, and et cetera. But I think that, yeah, 
10 years? Yeah, well, actually, it, maybe not. Uh, maybe RPA isn't really required for that because you already see AI being infused in uh, Outlook. Like you, you, it sort of suggests uh, like your sentences. That's what it's already doing. But the and thing is with Windows, already... right? If it can listen, it can monitor, it knows all the endpoints, you know, because it wouldn't just see what I'm doing on screen, right? It can see the performance on the process. It can see everything, the data uploads. It can see all of that, you know, where if you're just doing AI at an app level, it only interfaces in what you're doing at app level. What happens is around the transition between apps, the data you move between apps, mm -hmm. the PowerPoints that you do over and over again, all of a sudden it pre-builds them because it goes, hey, I've seen you build these a uh, 100 times. Um, I, I've Your microphone was on, so I, I heard you talking out loud about how you're going to create it. You know, your exactly. camera is on, so I can see how you're getting frustrated with areas. So I'm going to solve those areas quicker for you. I yeah. don't know, you know. It's, it's well, that, that could be an interesting time to be alive. Well, uh, to be alive in, yeah. But the whole the whole AI thing that's also really really powerful. It's also coming. It's infused in uh, in AI, AI builder, obviously. And yeah, I think they're also um, they're like recently they they gave two hundred and fifty credits, and that now they ramped it up to five hundred. I guess is that five hundred calls a day or five hundred a month? Uh, I think it's just 500 credits a month. And for every license you get, it's just on the stack and you can just allocate those credits on, on different environments. What did you learn when you became an MVP that you didn't know before becoming an MVP? About the program, the MVP program, that type of thing. Uh, well, um, I haven't been an MVP for that long, but uh, I can tell that it's sort of overwhelming, like all the... <laughs> All the DL uh, emails you get. Uh, I'm a pro at uh, Outlook rules now. So uh, nice, it, exactly. It you get very good at yeah. making sure they get routed to their right uh, <laughs> yeah, subfolders, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's still something that I'm figuring out at the moment, like how to sort of cherry pick what's interesting for me. And um, actually, the, to be honest, that's still something I'm sort of figuring out at the moment. It's uh, it hasn't been uh, so long, and like what I mentioned uh, when uh, the, the show started, my wife just got pregnant, so that also tumbled things around. So it's uh, I, I try to do my best <laughs> to keep up with everything, but uh, yeah. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If you like the show and want to be a supporter, check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guide. Thanks again and see you next time.